Hello, I'm Pete Gerlach. I'm the author of the nonprofit Break the Cycle website that you may be watching, looking at, or hope you do. In this brief video, I'd like to introduce you to the theme, the main topic of Lesson 3 out of 8 in this website. Lesson 3 has to do with good grief. It's a subject that many people are a little uncomfortable with. Our society does not do a good job, in my opinion, of helping people understand bonding, losses, and grieving, and the importance of grief. So I want to touch on those subjects right now. First, how would you describe bonding in the context of human beings and human behavior? Well, what does bonding mean to you? Have you bonded with certain things in your life? Many people think automatically of bonding with people. Yes, healthy people form attachments, emotional, sometimes spiritual attachments, to certain special people. We also form bonds throughout our lives to a number of invisible things that have nothing to do with people. For example, we become bonded to our independence unless we become disabled. Um, we become bonded to our youth until we lose it to middle age and old age. We come, become bonded to places, special places, special music, special foods, special rituals. Many things we develop a great fondness for can be said that we bond to those things. Do you have some favorite music that you prefer to listen to, for instance? We all bond throughout our lives unless we're emotionally damaged. What you also know is that because of choice or chance, we break selected bonds. For instance, we cannot control losing our bond to youth and innocence and lack of responsibility. As we age, society expects us to put those down and we lose those prizes that we enjoyed for a number of years. So we have some choices we make, we have some losses that we make by choice, and some that we are forced to make by external circumstances. Um, losses cause disruption in our lives. Broken bonds cause us to lose our concentration lose our serenity, lose our focus. Losses vary in impact from minor to major. The losses associated with the death of a beloved person are rated by some sociologists and psychologists as the most profound, most impactful losses that average healthy human beings can sustain. Many other losses still are significant. Uh, one of the most popular groups of losses, unfortunately, in the American society is a set of losses that comes from psychologically, psychological or legal divorce. In case you have been divorced or you know someone well who has divorced, you will know that divorce causes people to lose security, to use, lose identity. I am no longer a married person to lose some degree of hope for the future, to lose independence, to lose financial security, perhaps for some, uh, to lose dreams, divorce, which people usually don't want and don't choose unless they're forced to, causes a group of invisible losses. So losses can be concrete. I'm so sad, my pet, dog just got run over. My grandmother, who I love dearly, just died. Those are physical, tangible losses. There is a group of invisible losses, abstract losses, that you can't take pictures of, but they still have a profound emotional effect on your life. Nature has provided us with a healing process, which, as you know, is called grieving or mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. They mean the same thing. 
It is a process whereby mentally, emotionally, and for some people spiritually, they can move through stages and gradually reach acceptance of that which they have lost. They can resume normal functioning in their lives and enjoying other aspects of their life. Mourning is a process that if you're healthy and if you're in the right kind of environment, it's automatic. However, for many reasons, for many people, mourning is blocked or hindered. In order to mourn in a good way, in a healthy way, you need at least three requisites. Can you name them? You know what they are? I bet your parents never taught you what they were. The first requisite for healthy, good grief is awareness. You have to be aware that you lost something of value. You also have to be aware of the impact the loss has on your life. Specifically, how is it affecting you? The opposite of awareness is denial or repression or minimizing or intellectualizing. All of those hinder full awareness of a broken bond and what the, bro what the break means. So the first requisite for healthy grieving is awareness. In my experience for 31 years as a therapist studying human nature, one thing that destroys or hinders awareness is being ruled by a, quote, false self. If you've studied lesson one in this website, you'll know the difference between a false self and a true self. I won't re re reiterate the difference now, but I do encourage you, if you don't know about the difference, study lesson one. It's highly relevant to your life, especially if you're a parent. So you need awareness. Usually that is a byproduct of having your true self direct your personality. The third thing you need for healthy grief is a what I call a pro-grief, P-R-O, grief environment. You have to be among people who appreciate and respect the bonding, losing, and grieving processes and who encourage and accept the signs of healthy grief. As you know, we grievers, we losers, because we're all losers in that sense, when we are grieving, we show a lot of emotion, principally shock, anger or rage, despair, numbness. We show emotional signs. We also have mental signs that we're grieving. We need to tell our story and be heard and understood empathically over and over again. I can't stand knowing that my grandmother is gone. I can't hear she gave me so much, blah, blah, blah. Grievers need to tell their story. They need to speak out loud a series of important questions. Why did this happen? Why did this happen now? Why did this happen to me? What could I have done to, to block this loss? What does this loss mean to me? What does this loss mean to people who are important to me? What do other people do when they lose this thing? Typically, grievers have an array of unique questions that occur to them over time. The first phase of the mental level of grieving is mental confusion that morphs into disorganized questions that come up repetitively. That morphs into tentative answers to the questions. And finally, in the final acceptance phase of the mental level of grief, the questions begin to die away as the answers become credible and we resume focusing on other parts of our lives mentally. The second level of healthy grief is the one that's most well known, thanks to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And that is the emotional or psychological level of grief. Most people have heard, indirectly or directly, 
when you have a loved one die, which is what she focused on, you go through several phases emotionally. Shock, disorientation, confusion, which is mental also. Then anger. Why did this happen? Why did this happen to me? It shouldn't have happened. The next phase of normal, healthy, emotional grief is sadness. That in extreme form, that can be despair. You can bounce back and forth between these phases, confusion, anger or rage, sadness or despair, over time, if you're in the right environment and if you're emotionally healthy. These phases move you towards feeling accepted. You accept your loss and what it means and you move on. You become less emotionally focused on the loss and its impact. The third of three levels in healthy grief for some people, not everybody, is spiritual. People who are devout and believe in a higher power and a supreme being, a benign supreme being, can question their faith if they lose something extraordinarily precious to them. They can question their God and say, how could you let this happen? I don't understand. You're supposed to be a loving God. People can go through a confusion about their faith, a loss of their faith, and in many cases, later, as time goes on and healing occurs, they regain their faith, which may even be stronger. So, healthy grieving has three levels mental, emotional, psychological, and for some, spiritual. To do, to go through these three levels, you need to have your true self in charge, you need to be aware of your loss and its impact, and you need to be among people who promote and endorse healthy grieving. One of the things that can block healthy grief is what I call an anti-grief policy. We all have policies about <clears throat> losses and grieving. A policy is a set of values and beliefs. If you, as a young person, were taught you're supposed to be happy all the time, you shouldn't burden other people with your problems. Don't cry in public. Don't get, ang don't get angry in public. People who show angry anger are bad. If you were taught things like that, that will inhibit healthy grief. Unless you change those core beliefs as you grow into adulthood, you will become an adult with an anti-grief policy. You are apt to unconsciously repress the normal healing process of grieving. You need to re-examine your own personal policy about losses and grieving and how to express your grief and where and when and with whom and establish a pro-grief policy. There's an article in Lesson 3 that explains much more about grief policies. The second kind of grief policy you need in order to do good grief is to be among people who themselves promote consistently healthy grief attitudes and values. You need to be around people who are comfortable if you need to express grieving emotions, meaning anger or sadness or despair and hopelessness. You need to be encouraged to tell your story over and over. You need to be encouraged to ask these questions that have no answers except your own. And you have to be among people who, in appropriate ways, can offer you sympathetic and empathic touching, which is very healing in many ways. You have to be around people who are comfortable if you need to cry. Say, it's okay. You'll be okay. So you need to have a pro-grief policy inside your skin, and you need to be consistently among people who have a pro-grief policy outside of your skin. If you live in a dysfunctional family, the second one is much less likely. 